Hey and good morning. Happy New Year. My name is Joel Ochoa. This is my sister Lydia and uh, this is our dad who you probably know as Chaplain Q. We are so excited to join you guys virtually today. Um, wishing you guys a Happy New Year, continually celebrating our Christmas season and ushering in a great new year. Just, we want to say joy to the world. Bring that joy everywhere that we go, around the entire world that we can share with you this morning. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him through. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men in their songs implore. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat. Yes, joy to the world. The Lord has come. And we're grateful for that message that uh, uh, into our darkness, a Savior has come. A baby born in a manger. A baby who wants to be born in your heart and in mine has come. We have hope that people in previous generations did not have. But because of this baby, we now have a hope, not only for this life, but for all of life eternal. Uh, thank you to my son Joel and to Lydia. I appreciate them leading a little bit of worship here this morning. And uh, as a dad, it's uh, definitely a deep blessing. It's very, I'm uh, very thankful that they would uh, say yes to an invitation that their old man brings to them. Hey, would you like to help with uh, leading online worship? And they've also helped with our in-person services as well. And for that, I'm grateful. Friends, we're also grateful for you. Uh, we're grateful that we have this incredible privilege of ministering here in the Western Home communities and also in the community. Every single member of our spiritual care team, we are blessed with relationships, not only within the Western Home, but from ministries and places where we have served before. So we want to continue to be just faithful stewards of the time and the place and the space and the resources that God has given to us. So uh, we just want to say thank you. Um, many of you have responded incredibly generously to our invitation that if you were, uh, if you felt so led to give a year-end gift to our Fresh Wind Fund or our Alice Eisenhower Visitation Fund, that could really help us sort of get a landscape of uh, what we might have at our disposal, what God is providing for us to then move forward into the new year. And one of the things that we're hoping to do is just quicken the pace of our ministry a little bit, particularly around our Sunday morning in-person services, our Fresh Wind Worship Services in the Diamond Event Center. So hopefully within the next couple of months, we can add more staff, And uh, but please stay tuned. But in the meantime, we just hope this finds you well. I know uh, Christmas, uh, as you probably are watching this, that uh, uh, our gatherings with family and friends, for most of us, might be in the past. And I pray that there would have been some uh, memories made and some moments shared. And I pray that there could have been some reflection and maybe some words and just uh, something that would acknowledge the fact that the real reason for the season is Jesus Christ. God come to earth. God saying, yes to you and me, even lost in sin and darkness, saying, I have come to save, that they might have hope and light and life. So as we're turning the corner here into, into a new year, uh, we still want to sing some Christmas songs, so uh, we're going to sing still a few more, uh, but we're also going to have a message today about new beginnings. 
and uh, being obedient to God. And we have the ability to say yes to the Lord. Even when we failed him in the past, he has new beginnings and new chapters uh, for us to discover. And they are only made possible because of his grace, because of his truth, because of his work on the cross and through the empty tomb on our behalf. So if you would, join me in a word of prayer before we continue on with our worship. Father in heaven, we thank you for, uh, uh, I thank you for each and every heart that might be watching this video. As this is being recorded shortly before January 1st of 2023, Father, I pray that maybe if this video is watched five years or 10 years from now, that uh, whoever might be watching it would, uh, would hear something that comes from your word would be moved by a moment of worship, would uh, something would happen to them on the inside that would allow them to surrender and turn their hearts towards you. Father, we know that that is what you're wanting to do. Um, even in the changing weather, even in the rough and tough weather that we're experiencing right now here in Iowa, Father, all of these things, I remember hearing uh, someone older and wise that said, it's good for us to go through season because it just reminds us that we are not in charge. And Father, we are not in charge. We declare that we need a Savior, that we need someone that would reach out to us to save us from despair, that would lead us into ways that are better than the ones that we thought we could go in ourselves. And Father, the good news is uh, that uh, that counseling, that guiding has come. That Savior is here. He is no longer with us physically, but he did come over 2,000 years ago as we celebrated in Christmas. But by his Spirit, we still can be led towards saying yes to salvation that is found in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you again for this time together, even though it's online, uh, but thank you for what can happen in our hearts as we turn them towards you and say yes to your whispers. And your whispers are, come, follow me. Surrender all that you are to me. You'll never regret being my father. Not that, not that things will be easy, but it's something that I can do to mold you and shape you and transform you and uh, lead you into life everlasting. So thank you again for this time together. Thank you for this time of worship, for this time of year. And we lift these things up and say thank you again in Jesus' name, in his name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> Till he appeared and the soul 
friends, I attempted to record a message in the chapel, but it was a little late at night, so I decided to uh, uh, tweak it a little bit and uh, uh, pray about it a little bit more, and uh, here I am in my office, and so I'm excited to, uh, to be here today, and thank you again for joining us online. Uh, uh, at the time that we're recording this, it's in that uh, time, that, that kind of squishy time between Christmas and New Year's, uh, but this is being released on New Year's Day, on January 1, 2023. Can you believe it? Wow. Wow, I was born in 1964, and I never, in my wildest dreams, thought I, w I couldn't possibly think that far ahead. But uh, here we are on the beginning, at the beginning, at the threshold of a new year. And I pray that you've all had a wonderful Christmas. I pray that you've had a great season with family and friends. And I know that we're not quite done yet. That's why we're still singing a few Christmas songs. But I am praying that these past few weeks have been a blessing for you, uh, connections with family and friends that that more memories have been made and again in the midst of all of this and I know for some this is not a super happy or joyful um, time but uh, just a reminder from my heart to yours and as as, as as we focus yeah on a lot of parties and presents and get-togethers but uh, just a reminder that Jesus Jesus a baby born in a manger is the reason for the season Jesus the Christ Jesus the Messiah so as we look forward to the new year, um, I think it's time, not inappropriate, to think about new beginnings. So here we are, first of the year. So the message for today I thought would be kind of a good thing is to talk about the first miracle of Jesus as he began his public ministry. So if I were to say, do you know what his first miracle is? Would some of you know the answer to that? He did a lot of miracles. We know that he did a lot of healing and a lot of, uh, a lot of wonderful things. He cast out demons. He, he raised people from the dead. But there was a first miracle that was recorded in the Bible. So I'm not going to say quite yet. Some of you probably already know. But I want to talk a little bit about kind of where we're at in the life of Jesus and kind of how uh, we're arriving at this story. Well, just a reminder that uh, we just got done celebrating the baby Jesus in the manger, uh, born in Bethlehem. And this baby Jesus, like every baby, well, he eventually grew up, just like any other boy. Uh, we know things about his birth and his childhood, maybe up until right around the temple. But then between the ages of 13 and 30, we only have one descriptive verse about what the life of Jesus was like. And it's Luke 2.52, where it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. The key word is that he grew. He was growing, he was maturing. And then after, um, uh, when all of a sudden uh, there's a more description of the life of Jesus, we see that uh, he's baptized in the Jordan with, uh, River by his cousin, John the Baptist. And then after that happened, the Spirit leads Jesus into the desert. And this is right before he begins his public, his, his public ministry. The desert, have you ever noticed that? He was in the desert, and he was not there just for a little visit. He was there for 40 days and for 40 nights. Now, that had to be a rough time. Now, why, at this chronological time, before his public ministry of miracles and healing, why would he be led by the Spirit into the desert? What happened there that might be important for us to know? question I have is that if he wasn't in the desert where it's hot and there's no food, there's no McDonald's or fast food or anything, um, we don't know how he survived physically other than um, uh, he, we know that he did. Uh, was he weakened? Physically, he might have been. And it's interesting that at the end of the story, the devil thought that he had been weakened, especially spiritually. And the devil was licking his chops, hoping to defeat Jesus before he even got out of the starting blocks to begin his ministry. And if you read the story, um, he was tempted. I think he was tempted the entire time he was out in the desert, but we hear the three times that he was tempted at the end of his time in the desert. And uh, we can conclude 
by the way that Jesus answered. I love how he answered. Jesus, um, uh, the devil thought that Jesus would be weakened, but he was not. As a matter of fact, Jesus was so strong. He was able to say no to the devil's tempting in a very powerful and clear way. So um, how did he do that? Well, I believe, as we pay attention to the story, he was strengthened, actually, by his time of trial and ten temptation. Maybe it was almost like a training. You know how an athlete trains and does a lot of hard physical work. Well, maybe that's what was going on in Jesus' life. He was actually training and kind of building up, uh, maybe, uh, before he began his ministry among the people. But definitely, there was something that was going on in that desert, and, and it, it, it's clear to see as we read that story, that Jesus was relying and focusing on his relationship with his Father, and he was able to withstand the devil. That's a good lesson for you and me, as we focus and rely on our relationship with our Heavenly Father, we can withstand temptation. So now, he kind of got launched into, um, uh, into his ministry, and uh, uh, he went about calling a handful of guys to be his disciple, and he said, disciples, and he said, follow me, and they did. And uh, right away, uh, we read that he landed at a place called Cana, and he was there with uh, his disciples, but also his mother. His mother was there. Mary was there with him. And this is where Jesus would begin his ministry of miracles, of healings, of showing signs and wonders that, that would reveal that he eventually would, that we would come to know him and people would know him as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And eventually he would reveal himself and to the whole world that he was the Savior to come and take away and pay the price for all of our sins. So let's get to the story. Jesus changes water into wine. It's the story of the wedding at Cana, and we find it in John 2, verses 1 through 12. And the uh, story is going to be on the screen, so uh, uh, please uh, read along. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. It was the custom to serve wine at weddings, like today. Uh, and then um, Jesus says, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. That's an interesting answer. Jesus was saying, hey, don't get me too involved because I have a plan and I'm going to stick to it. It's what my father has called me to do. And there was a little bit kind of maybe a little bit of a jolt, but it actually turned into a wonderful moment. Verse 5, his mother, Mary, said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet, the guy in charge of the banquet. He was the guy in charge of the wine that eventually was, had run out. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. Huh. And I love this. So the servants who had drawn the water, the servants who had been obedient and, uh, and filled the jars with water, they knew. They knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. I love that. Verse 11 and then 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days. I'd like to offer uh, three lessons, three takeaways from the story that I hope can help us as we stand on the threshold of the year 2023. Now, we're not going to talk about New Year's resolutions. You've probably heard too many of those, and it's kind of useless to talk about those because by uh, January 5, uh, we're all done with them. So I promise no New Year's resolutions. But as I spent some time in this story, um, um, a, a few lessons kind of came forward. And uh, uh, the first lesson I think is good for us to understand, especially in our modern and immediate, I want it now kind of times. We live in those days, don't we? If not for you, I know this is good for me to understand. But the first lesson is, take your requests. As we read the story, take your requests to Jesus, but humbly accept his answer, 
his answer. We see at the beginning of the story that even Mary, even, even the mother of Jesus, he can't make him do anything. That's not quite the uh, mother-son relationship that we might be familiar with. But Mary can't make Jesus do anything. So what does Mary do? She humbles herself. She gives Jesus the authority to do what he says is right. And then she goes about encouraging the servants and the people around her, hey, hey, if Jesus tells you to do something, do whatever he tells you. She probably knew him best, even better than the disciples. So already she kind of had a sense that, you know, this mother-son thing, um, actually, he's Lord. Do whatever he tells you. So for you and for me, here's the question. Do you and I trust God to be God? Or is that a role that we kind of secretly or not so secretly, we really want for ourselves? So the encouragement is, yes, bring your requests to the Lord, but lay down your preconceived notions as to how the Lord should answer, how God should answer. Be humble, power down, accept crave for Jesus to answer his way. Why? Because let's face it, you and I, we've already screwed things up a lot in our lives, haven't we? I know I have. The second encouragement is this. It's an encouragement to cultivate, to grow, to mature, to have a trusting and obedient heart. Cultivate a trusting and obedient heart. Now listen closely to this. When we truly grow to trust when we seek to obey the Lord, do you know what is the natural spiritual outcome of this? Take a guess. Something that we all need, and it seems to be kind of uh, thin around us. What is the natural outcome of us trusting and obeying God? What do you think it is? It's peace. Peace. Trusting and obeying God brings peace to our lives, to our hearts, to our souls. We crave it. He wants to tell you and me, he's got it. He'll show us he's never wrong. He's God. Again, do what he asks. Go where he sends. Obey humbly. Jesus said so clearly, at first, when the wine had run out, what does he say? Go and fill jars with water. What? That doesn't make sense. Why? How come? What good is that going to do? There's no rationale to this. But he did command. Go and fill your jars with water. That's the title of this message. When we trust the Lord, when it might not make sense, when we obey in faith what he asks us to do, you just might be witness. You might just be on the threshold of something wonderful. You just might get to see a miracle. Which brings us to insight number three. In God's hands, friends, in God's hands, remember this. I need to remember this. The ordinary becomes extraordinary. This is so thrilling. This is such good news. We see it time and time again in Scripture. God shows us that the ordinary is often the birthplace of the truly wonderful. The plain becomes powerfully transformed into something miraculous. We see miracles. Water is turned into delectable wine, the best that anyone has ever tasted. A few loaves and fishes. 5,000 people are fed, and then a whole bunch left over. A little shepherd boy kills an enemy of God with a slingshot, and then he goes on to become the glorious king of the nation of Israel. Or how about a little baby in swaddling clothes, in a manger? He grows up to be what? The savior of the world. Before we get too caught up in the excitement of seeing this dynamic in our lives, and I pray that you have a story of, 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 of seeing God do something that only he could do, or maybe in the lives of, of someone else that you know, when the simple and the ordinary becomes a loud and resounding hallelujah, let's be reminded that this is the work that God does, not us. He gets the glory. He gets the credit. Does he? Plain water, friends, is still being turned into wine all around us. You and I don't do the miracle. God does. So here we stand at the beginning of a new year. What is God asking you and me to do? 
Be obedient. Be humble. Say yes in a new and fresh way. He gives us that opportunity. Say yes to what the Lord might ask. Ah, fill your jars with water. That's what he's asking you and me to do. Fill your jars with plain water. God is all about the gift of a new beginning. Fill your jars with water. Three quick C.S. Lewis quotes where he talks about the past and the present and the future. C.S. Lewis says this, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Isn't that great news? How do we do that? Give God a chance to show you a miracle. Fill your jars with water. C.S. Lewis also writes, you're not the one that gives the new beginning. It's God that does this, and he's able to sustain it. Not you, not in your own strength, but in God's strength. And he's asking you and me to fill our jars with water. C.S. Lewis writes, there are better things ahead than any we leave behind. But first, be humble, be obedient, Fill your jars with water. I'd like to end with 1 John 5.5. 5. This is a great verse. And it's a question. It starts with a question. Who is it that overcomes the world? Would you like to know? Who is it that God allows to rise up about, uh, above anything that might be a part of a broken and fallen and sinful world? Who is it that overcomes the world? Are you curious? Well, the answer is going to fly up. Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why he came, to reveal himself as Lord and Savior, the only way to the Father, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the presence of the Father except by believing in him. So I just want to end by saying Happy New Year. And here's my wish, that may we give more and more of ourselves to the Lord. May our yes be deeper and deeper as the years and days go by. Whatever age you might be, wherever you might be in your journey with Jesus, maybe you need to say yes to him for the first time. The question, have you said yes to Jesus? He's worthy of that yes. He's worthy of that trust. He's worthy of that obedience. And he's still in the business of doing miracles, of life, of healing, of peace, of turning plain water into wonderful and glorious wine. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us for worship today. We hope you have had a blessed, blessed holiday season celebrating with friends and family and most importantly celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we are told to go and share everywhere on the mountaintops, in the seas, in the valleys. <laughs> go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night,
Happy New Year!